Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're giving 30 seconds more before we start this wonderful event uh, that we are all looking forward to, including myself. Uh, and whilst everybody um, joins us, I will just start saying it. hello. I am Gabriella. Greetings to all of you from London. I am a soprano and also the founder and curator of the charitable foundation Donne Women in Music, which aims to more and more promote the stories and the music of women from past and present. And we couldn't be sharing most moving stories than today in this wonderful event. Um, and I welcome you all to this online event today, The Sound of Hope, Women Musicians During the Holocaust. And I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Kelly Brown. Hello, Dr. Kelly. Hi, Gabriella. Dr. Brown is a violinist, conductor, writer, and a Holocaust researcher living in the USA. She teaches uh, music at Milligan University. And she's the author of the book, The Sound of Hope, Music as Solace, Solace, Resistance and Salvation During the Holocaust and World War II. That was just released this past summer and has been gaining a lot of attention nationally and internationally. So welcome, Kelly. We are so excited to have this conversation with you today uh, that bear witness to the stories of women musicians during the Holocaust. Thank you, Gabriella. I appreciate so much the work that you're doing to promote women in music. It's such important work. It's such needed work. And I thank you for this invitation to have a conversation today about women during the Holocaust. Well, it's my pleasure. And I will tell at the end of the story of how we met, we, we met and it was because of one of these stories of these women of the past that I had the joy of meeting Dr. Kelly and inviting her to, to share her stories with us here today. Uh, so just a, a few uh, things. Uh, I will be really uh, looking forward to listening to Dr. Kelly as well. So I'll ask you all if you have questions, just hold on until the end and then I, I will be able to read them uh, on the chat because if you post the questions too early I might not be able to see them properly all right um, so let's let's start um, Kelly you've been researching this music for almost 20 years so can you tell us uh, a bit more about uh, how this research started and an overview of this new book absolutely so in 2003, I read a biography of Alma Rosé, an internationally renowned violinist who was sent to Auschwitz, and really that book changed the course of my life. I began to research music's role in the Holocaust, and I discovered the stories of more and more remarkable people, composers and conductors and performers who just they, they stubbornly clung to music amid incredible uh, suffering. Um, and they used music to uplift the human spirit and to triumph over oppression and to preserve their culture. And as I was learning these stories, I also came to realize that there might be individual books written about certain people or memoirs, but there wasn't one book that brought all their stories together that sort of found this this thread of the power of music and connected it together. And so that's how my book came to be. Um, sometimes I describe it as sort of like piecing together a quilt. And with each story that I discovered, it just became uh, more beautiful. And, and also in my research, I came to know even more fully about how the Nazis used music as a medium for manipulation and abuse and, and really as a cog in the machinery of genocide. So in, in telling the stories of music during the Holocaust, there's no way to escape describing the atrocities. We have to be willing to know fully what happened. Um, and so what I want to do is to balance that alongside the horrific, there is the hopeful. 
I can imagine. It, it must be so hard. I can't imagine going through so many stories. I've been deeply through one story, uh, which really moved me through researching and discovering women composers uh, from the past. So uh, it's it must be extremely difficult. And I but I understand that it probably gives you more urge to tell these stories and share them with as many people as possible. So I hope this is what we're going to do here today. Um, and I hope this video can reach many people, even if people couldn't be here with us right now. Um, your book tells stories not only from Europe, it also tells stories of women in South Pacific. Is that correct? Yes. Would you like to share some of these stories with us? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen here. I want to start um, with Alma Rosé, the violinist I just met, mentioned, who was the first person that um, I learned about. Alma grew up in Vienna in, in a family that was musical royalty. Her uh, uncle was the great composer, conductor Gustav Mahler. You see him here with Alma's mother, uh, Justine, his sister. Her father was uh, Arnold Rosé, who was one of the most famous violinists in the late 19th, early 20th century. He was the concert master of the Vienna Philharmonic and the Vienna Opera Orchestra, taught at the Vienna um, Conservatory, he founded the Rosé String Quartet, which was one of the most famous string quartets of that time. Alma began to um, study violin when she was age five. She studied with her father, whom she adored, and they both became very serious about shaping her um, into um, an internationally renowned violinist, even as a young age. And her father would prohibit her from playing any games or sports that might damage her hands. And by the time she was 12 years old, she was practicing six hours a day which is a lot for a 12 year old. And she was already admitted and studying at the Vienna Conservatory. And by the early 1930s, Alma had this successful performing career. Um, but all of this ended for her and her family with the Nazi annexation of Austria in 1938. Her entire family was banned from performing. Her father was fired from uh, the conservatory and from the orchestras that he played in. She and her father were eventually able to flee to England. This photo is from a British newspaper in 1939 that announced their arrival. But once a wealthy family, when they got here, they were penniless. And so Alma felt uh, the need to support her family. And so when a performance opportunity in Holland became available, she took it. And while she was in uh, Holland, the Nazis invaded and she was trapped there. And she eventually tried to escape to Switzerland, but she was captured by the Gestapo and sent to Auschwitz. When she arrived, she was sent to Block 10, which was the experimental medical block where Dr. Joseph Mengele was doing his horrific experiments. And when she walked in the room and looked around and saw what was happening, she thought, I'm going to die here. And she, she demanded that a violin be brought to her. She wanted her music as solace because she thought she was about to die. And even though she was a Jewish prisoner, her reputation was such that a violin was brought to her. And what she began to do is to give nightly concerts for the poor women in that medical block. And these concerts not only gave hope to these women, but it also saved her because the prisoners who were working in the office made sure that her name was never on the list of experiments for the next day. But it didn't take very long for Maria Mondel, who was the head SS of the women's camp, to learn of Alma Rosé's presence. And she had her transferred to the medical block, which is how Alma realized that there was an orchestra in Auschwitz. But actually, an orchestra of prisoners was not a rare thing. Many camps had them. Auschwitz had three 
two men's orchestras and this one women's orchestra, which is the only female orchestra in the whole camp system. You know, and we might say, why in the world would there be orchestras in a concentration camp? And, and it's a complex question. Um, there are many reasons. Number one, the Germans had a great love for music and they recognized its power. And so they forced musicians to play music to, to entertain them. They also forced these musicians to play marching music. So the orchestra would play in the morning as prisoners march to their work detail and then play again in the evening when they marched back. And the musicians were on call 24 hours a day if, if somebody wanted to hear music. And it's one of the great dissonances of the Nazi mindset is that they could callously murder people and then come in and, and be emotionally moved by hearing beautiful pieces of music. In this drawing, you can see the orchestra having to play while other prisoners march back from their work in the evening. I'm assuming this is the evening because some of them are so exhausted that they're having to be carried. And you can imagine that playing in the orchestra while the other prisoners marched to work did not make the orchestra members very popular among their fellow captives who sometimes considered them collaborators and hurled insults at them. But of course, these musicians, they had no choice, play or be killed. So Alma Rosé was forced to become the conductor of the women's orchestra, which unlike the men's orchestra was mostly made up of amateur musician. Women weren't playing in professional orchestras during this time period. So most of these women um, were more folk instruments, like they played guitars and mandolins. So she conducted a, an orchestra that had, you know, some violins and flutes, but also had these folk instruments. But what she realized early on is that she could help save lives, because if the Nazis wanted this orchestra, which they did, she could leverage that to get things like extra food rations or a stove. In, in the barracks. And so she did that, but life was incredibly miserable and painful for them all. But she worked very hard to help the orchestra improve because she knew that was essential to their survival, that the better they played, the more likely it would be that they would um, not be killed. And she had to write all the arrangements that they played. And so sometimes she would stay up all night working on new arrangements. And in a short period of time, they had a repertoire of over 200 pieces. It was really amazing. So I want to tell you about two of the women um, that Amma helped save. As a teenager, Esther Bejarano was sent to Auschwitz. And when Nazi officials wanted to assemble this women's orchestra, she was summoned to audition because they knew that she was a singer and a pianist. Uh, but they didn't have a piano at this time. And so they handed her an accordion and they say, if you play this, you can join the orchestra. She had never held an accordion in her hand in her life. And so she had about 60 seconds to figure out how it worked. And she did. And she was accepted into the orchestra and music saved her life. Anita. Ballfish was also sent to Auschwitz as a teenager. When she was going through that horrific intake procedure where they were getting their head shaved and a number tattooed, the prisoner who was doing that work just asked her what she did before the war. And she said, I played the cello. And then unexpectedly, this person said, terrific, you'll be saved. And she told her to stand to the side and, and Anita said, here I was naked with my head shaved and I was standing to the side and this elegant woman began to come toward me. She was a prisoner, but a very elegant woman. And she questioned her and said, do you indeed play the cello? And Anita said, yes, I do. And the woman said, my name is Alma Rose and you'll be in the orchestra. And so this was an invitation to life. But Anita's cello playing also caught the eye of Dr. Mangala. And on occasion, he would come into the block and want her to play for him. He particularly wanted her to play Schumann's Traumerei. So I'm going to play a little excerpt right now. And I want you to imagine 
what it was like to have this beautiful music juxtaposed with such hate, to imagine what Anita must have felt having to play this for such an evil man. So I'm so happy to share that not only did Esther survive the war, but she's still alive today. She is 95 years old. She's one of the last living survivors of the Women's Orchestra. She's still playing music and she's a member of a band called the Microphone Mafia. And uh, she's using her music to be an advocate in the fight against racism. Back uh, this past October, she received uh, the Hermann Moss Prize for her life's work in pursuit of racial and social justice. And when she talks about her time in the orchestra, she really reveals the fundamental truth of what she endured. As long as I play, I live. Anita also survived the war and is still with us today. She's also 95 and is so active giving her testimony but you know, surviving is, is not easy. There's an incredible weariness that comes from that responsibility to bear witness for so many years. And I can see that strain in her face and her voice from over 75 years uh, of doing this. Um, her entire life has been defined about what happened to her when she was 17 years old. And so surviving was also hard because of the difficulty of reconciling their role um, in the camps, this kind of survivor's guilt. And, and what Anita says is that we played with tears in our eyes and guns in our back. While Alma Rose was instrumental in saving the lives of many women um, like Anita and Esther, she herself did not survive to see the end of the war. She died in Auschwitz in April of 19. Uh, 44. May her memory be a blessing. I want to tell you about another amazing woman, Alice Herrett Sommer. There's so much about Alice's life that mirrors Alma's. Alice was born to a wealthy, influential family in Prague. She was a child prodigy, and by the 1930s, she was also making a name for herself on the international stage. In 1931, she married the love of her life, Leopold Sommer, and then a few years later, her son, Rafi, was born. But the same thing happened to Alice's Prague that had happened to Alma's Vienna. The Nazis uh, took over, and in 1943, she and her mother and her husband and her six-year-old son were sent to Terezin. Terezin, as it's known in Czech or Theresienstadt, as the Germans called it, it's located about 30 kilometers outside of Prague. And it was technically labeled as a concentration camp, as, as, as kind of a concentration camp slash ghetto. And, and the Nazis used this to house um, Czech artists and musicians and members of the intelligentsia. And, and here they were subjected to horrific conditions of overcrowding and lack of food and lack of medicine, rampant disease, just truly every deprivation that you can imagine. And they also lived here in fear of deportation because this ghetto slash camp also served as a transit camp and trains were leaving regularly for the extermination camps of Treblinka and Auschwitz. Because of the population, 
that was sent to Terezin. Many prominent composers and conductors and performers like Alice were there. And the prisoners themselves organized their own musical activities. Um, and, and they did these though in secret because it was forbidden. One cellist, when he found out he was being deported to Terezin, he took his cello apart into tiny pieces and hid it amongst the clothes in his luggage with some glue. And when he got into Terezin, he glued the instrument back together. That's what music meant to them. But in time, the Nazis actually allowed and then began to encourage music because they saw it as a way of manipulation, as a way of propaganda to try to convince the world that the Jews were being well treated. They even used the music at Terezin to convince a group of Red Cross representatives who came to inspect the camp. And so there were amazing musical performances that happened because of the talent of people. Uh, operas were performed like Mozart's Magic Flute, Mendelssohn's Elijah was performed, and Alice um, gave over 100 piano recitals in Terezin, all from memory. And she also began to teach the children piano lessons in secret because it was forbidden to educate the children. And many of the prisoners at Terezin really discovered the truth that Alice would state after the war when people said, how in the world could you make music in such horrible conditions? And she would always say, music was life. We did not, could not, would not give up. But it, but it is important to note that during the Holocaust, music did not bring comfort or serve as spiritual resistance for everyone. For some, it had the opposite effect. The thing that was most precious to them had been used as a weapon. It had been tainted. Some who survived could never play music. Again, that joy of that gift was stolen from them. One violinist in Auschwitz was forced to play the French national anthem while a uh, French prisoner was hanged. And afterwards, he could not reconcile how his music had been used, and he committed suicide. Alice and Rafi did survive the war, but Alice's mother and husband were murdered. Alice and Rafi um, survived because her music one day in the camp, a guard came up to Alice and said, I love your piano music. And when you perform, I listen at the window and I have made sure that you and your son's name are not on the deportation list. And so Alice and Rafi returned to Prague uh, and she began to nurture his incredible musical talent, but it never felt like home again because the Soviet Union had taken over and she, thought that one tyranny had been exchanged for another, and there was still so much anti-Semitism there. And so they immigrated to Israel, and Rafi became an internationally renowned cellist. Both of them eventually moved to London. And Alice not only survived, but she thrived. She was still practicing the piano three hours a day when she turned 100. Upon her death, in 2014, she was 110 years old. She was the oldest known Holocaust survivor. Alice was incredible. Fania Dermashkin grew up in Vilna, Lithuania, in a family of accomplished musicians. Her father was a conductor. Her brother Wolf had studied at the Vilna and Warsaw conservatories. He was a conductor of the Vienna, I'm um, sorry, the Vilna Symphony Orchestra. And Fania and her sister Henia uh, continued in that family's tradition. Fania studied piano at the Vilna Conservatory and her sister studied voice there. When the Nazis invaded Vilna in June of 41, the Dermashkin family was forced into the Vilna ghetto. And despite the miserable conditions there, music abounded. 
Wolf Dramashkin organized a hundred voice choir and an orchestra and Fania and Henya performed regularly. And they lived there for over two years until the Nazis liquidated that ghetto. And Fania and Hendia, Henia ended up in the Dachau concentration camp. And at the end of the war, they were led on a death march and were abandoned in the mountains. And it was in the mountains that they were discovered by American troops. And they were sent to a place called St. Otilian to recover. So this is where Fania and Henya ended up in what seems like a very unlikely setting for a DP camp. St. Otilian was a Benedictine monastery and the Nazis had taken it over as a military hospital. And at the end of the war, about 400 survivors from Dachau had been brought here to recover. And so the US government decided to officially turn it into a displaced persons camp. And it was here at St. Otilian where Fania met Max Becker, a talented violinist who was also from Vilna and had served at the conservatory. He had been in a POW camp, Stalag 8A. And at the end of the war, um, the Germans had released a lot of the prisoners, but he was Jewish. And so he was also sent on a death march. And his group who were starving and near death also ran into some American troops and were sent to St. Otilian. And there these two fell in love. And while people were recovering at Otilian, there was also music. Max and Fania and Henia were not the only musicians there at St. Otilian. And so they joined forces and began the ex-concentration camp orchestra. At first they were giving concerts for the other um, recovering prisoners there, former prisoners and the staff, and then they began to travel. And they dressed in uniforms to remind people of the reality that they had been living in. And they performed for American troops. They traveled by bus to give concerts, including at the Nuremberg Opera House during when the Nuremberg war crimes trials were happening. Um, in 1948, a 29 year old Leonard Bernstein came to town and guests conducted two concerts with them, including sitting at the piano and playing Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue with them. But this orchestra was never meant to be long term. It was a transitional time for all of them as they tried to figure out the next step in their life. So the group disbanded in 1949 and Max Becker and the Dermashkin sisters eventually immigrated to the United States and Max and Fania married and spent the rest of their life in this adopted country. And their daughter Sonia is a very dear friend of mine and I'm so honored to share her parents' story today. To conclude this presentation, I want to take us to the South Pacific. This is a World War II story. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese army began to quickly overtake the islands in the Pacific that were populated by large numbers of Dutch and English colonists. As the Japanese gained ground, people began to flee to Singapore because it was seen as sort of an impenetrable fortress that couldn't be breached. But by early February, the British government um, realized that Singapore was going to fall. And so they began to order the evacuation of English women and children and civilian men. And so cargo ships were hastily and poorly outfitted with guns in preparation to try to get these people back to England. And among the women and children who were evacuating on these ships were two English musicians, Nora Chambers, a violinist who had studied at the Royal Academy of Music in London, and she was teaching violin lessons in Malaya. And the other woman, Margaret Dryberg, was an organist and a choir director, and she was a Presbyterian missionary to the Chinese population there in Singapore. So Nora boarded a ship called the Viner Brook, and Margaret boarded a ship called the Matahari. What the passengers didn't know it was, was that it was too late. 
the government had waited too long to order an evacuation and Japanese ships and aircraft were in control of the waters and lying in wait for these ships. Um, within two days, the Viner Brook was bombed by six aircraft. Um, it destroyed the boat and the lifeboats and the passengers ended up in the water holding on to whatever debris that they could grab. Margaret's boat, the Matahari, was not bombed, but it was captured by a, a Japanese ship and they were all taken prisoner. Gradually, the people in the water began to float onto Banka Island that you see there on your far right. Some had been in the water eight hours and some had been in the water for 60 hours. And so Nora Chambers was in this group that eventually washed up on the shore. And so the Japanese collected all these prisoners um, out of the water and off the ships they had captured, and they relocated them to the island of Sumatra. And there were about 400 women and children and some civilian men in this group. And they split the men and women and put them into respective camps. And you know, also just horrible conditions that they were being held in with just unrelenting tropical heat and disease and little or no food. Um, sometimes they would only be given a bag of dry rice and in it would be stones and glass and they would have to pick through it one grain at a time. As with in the Nazi concentration camps, the Japanese command was obsessed with counting the, the prisoners, a procedure they called tanko. The guards would blow a loud whistle to summon the internees and they had to come out and be counted and bow deeply to, uh, as a symbol to Hirohito, the emperor of the land of rising sun. And to survive, many of these women said they just pretended in their heads that they were bowing to their favorite composer or to God. And so it was in this situation that Nora and Margaret met, and they came up with a plan to bring music. Unlike in the Nazi camps where instruments were available, they had nothing. And so they envisioned creating a vocal orchestra where you would transcribe classical masterworks into four vocal parts. They wouldn't be sung with words, but with syllables, with oohs and ahs. And all of this was made possible because of Margaret's eidetic memory. She had perfect recall of any piece she had heard. So amid this incredible suffering, Margaret began arranging music onto scraps of paper, like you see here with the Largo from Dvorak's New World Symphony. And Nora recruited singers and conducted the group. You know, some were experienced, some were inexperienced. So the weaker singers stand, stood next to the stronger ones. But the Japanese had forbidden the women from congregating. So they had to rehearse at night in secret by the light of a single bulb. And, and Nora was very patient, but also exacting in how the group sang. After the war, one of the members said, Nora never let a false note or a muddled phrase pass by. She made us go back again and again until we got the music just right. So to sing measure 32 and 33 correctly became very important to us. And it took our minds off of whether we were hungry or thirsty or sick. Concert in December of 1943 was an exciting day in the camp. Um, all the women and children couldn't wait to get to this concert. There was even an attempt to try to clean themselves up to, to make it a special event. There was one last tube of lipstick circulating among the women. And so they decided to put that on and, and, and try to make such a special uh, event after that. And Nora and Margaret had worked so hard to really organize a performance. And here are some of the pieces that they had arranged that were gonna be on this concert. And so there were 30 members in the orchestra that came out that afternoon to perform, seated on stools. 
most of them barefoot because their shoes had long given out most of them with their arms and legs and bandages covering tropical sores and so after they had been seated nora stepped forward and she read an introduction that margaret had written and i want to read you that introduction because it tells us so much about what was special about this event this evening we are asking you to listen to something quite new we are sure a group of women's voices trying to reproduce some of the well-known music usually given by an orchestra the idea of making ourselves into a vocal orchestra came to us when we longed to hear some of the wonderful melodies and harmonies that uplifted our souls in days gone by so we make our humble attempt to let you hear some of the masterpieces as well as we can remember them we do not profess to reproduce the effects or quality of stringed or reed instruments but as the lovely melodies and harmonies of the great masters greet your ears may you imagine you hear them so close your eyes and try to imagine that you are in a concert hall hearing Toscanini or Sir Thomas Beecham conduct his world famous orchestra. So that concert went so well that immediately the other prisoners clamored to know when there was going to be another performance. So Margaret tried to remember more songs, including Ravel's Bolero, a very complicated work. And so they gave several more performances, but in time, the conditions deteriorated and had prolonged so many years that the women and children began to die from starvation and disease. And so no more music was able to be heard. After three years of imprisonment, the remarkable Margaret Dryberg died. Then four months later in August, um, the Japanese surrendered, but it took British troops another month to find these women and children. Um, the camps were spread out and there were even 41,000 women in camps all over the Far East. Finally, they began to airlift women and children out of there. And Nora recalls as she walked aboard an evacuation vehicle that she began to hear something behind her. She heard this rhythmic ostinato that sounded like Ravel's bolero. And she turned and she saw a few of the surviving members of the orchestra, the vocal orchestra, singing and saluting her with Ravel's bolero. And, and it was just a tribute to the life affirming work that she had done for them in the camp and Nora later recalled that she just wept unashamedly at the sound of these women. But as I mentioned with the Auschwitz orchestra survivors survivor surviving wasn't always easy freedom and trying to transition back into their traditional lives was hard for the women. They had been in captivity for three years. And before their capture, most of their lives had been directed by, by men, by their fathers and then, and then their husbands. But in the camp, they had been a society of women. And now overnight, they were expected to fit right back into their roles. And despite the horrific conditions of their imprisonment, one survivor commented that once we came out, we were less free. But for the women who were trying to heal from the camp and the war, the memory of the vocal orchestra, the way that music had helped them to bear their burdens, made it easier. And some of them shared these words about being in the vocal orchestra. In spite of all the smells and muck and goodness knows what, we literally forgot where we were. When I sang that vocal orchestra music, I forgot I was in the camp. I felt free. It was something that lived between us and it made us more near together. That was the wonder of music. 
So I'm going to play just a little excerpt from one of their pieces. This is one of their original arrangements as it was performed in the camp. This is the Dvorak Largo from the New World Symphony. Nora continued a life in music after the war. She and her family settled in the Channel Islands. She was a choir director at St. Mark's Church for many years. She never forgot what music had meant to her in those days as a prisoner. And she never forgot her dear friend, Margaret Dryberg. In conclusion, I'm gonna leave you with a simple poem that was written by one of the women imprisoned with Nora, a woman who did not survive to see the liberation. It, it speaks to the fundamental truth of their experience. I go my way singing, what air fate be bringing. I go my way singing. The world's my friend, oh, life's not for sorrow, no trouble I'll borrow, a fig for the morrow. I'll sing to the end. Thank you. I promise I was not going to cry, so you're making it difficult. Thank you so much. Uh, it's hard to know what to say after all this. I almost feel like I just want to be in silence out of respect. Um, I don't have uh, not as even close experience of all the research you've done, but if you don't mind, I just would like to share my story very briefly um, of one of these women, only one, but some a woman who deeply touched me and continues to, uh, to touch. So if you all give me one, is really one minute. I would love to tell you about Ilze. Um, Ilze Weber was a oh, technology. She was a an author and songwriter. She wrote mostly children's fiction. Um, her most popular book was Mendel Rosenbusch, and she learned to sing and play guitar, lute, mandolin, and balalaika. But she was never really a musician herself. Um, in 39, she was living in her village with her husband and two sons um, when her town was occupied and they were sent to 
Terezin. But they managed to send one of their children, Hanus, to London uh, in Sir Nicholas Winter's kinder transport, and he survived. And that was the last time she saw him because in 42, um, they all went to Theresienstadt. She wrote many letters to a friend in London uh, where she explained that she pretended things were okay. But as you can see, she says here, you will probably be happy to know how do we live here right now. It was all censored, so she had to talk in, in, in mystery words, almost like secret words. It's like dancing on a powder keg. The air is impregnated with insane rumors, which we no longer believe. Her true experience and emotion, emotions were conveyed in more than 60 poems she wrote while she was there. She was working in the hospital, entertaining the patients and the children, the elderly, to make their life more comfortable. Um, and that's how she, she made her difference while she was there. Uh, this is one of her songs and it's pretty much the song I came across a few years ago. Uh, one of the lullabies she wrote while she was there. And actually through the project, the Donne Women in Music, I discover her. Um, at the beginning of 94, the entire hospital was deported and they were sent to Auschwitz, um, where she and her son, Tommy, were murdered. Her husband survived and uh, luckily he managed to bury her poems before he was sent to Auschwitz and he managed to recover them many years later. And through one of her, um, many, many years later, her son met a friend who was also in Terezin with him and who survived Auschwitz. And this friend told him he remembered when Ilse Weber arrived uh, at Auschwitz with the children from Terezin. And he says, um, in 94, I noticed a group of 10 or 15 children had arrived. Ilse was in the middle comforting them. We were not allowed to talk to them, but I managed to speak to her because she recognized me. So she asked me, is it true that we can take a shower after the journey, she said. I didn't want to lie, so I said, no, that's no shower room, it's a gas chamber. And I will tell you something, I often heard you sing in the infirmary, go as quickly as possible into the chamber, sit with the children and start singing. Sing what you always sing with them, that way you will inhale the gas quicker. Otherwise, you will be trampled to death when panic breaks out. Ilse's reaction was strange. She laughed, somehow absent, hugged one of the children and said, so we will not be taking a shower. Um, that's one of her phrases. And after learning about her, I recorded, oops, sorry, I recorded one of her songs and also posted um, an article about her. And because of this article, Dr. Kelly got in contact. And I'm so grateful because um, these stories you shared with us today, they're so important. And I want to thank you personally for keeping them alive for saying their names for sharing and i hope many more people will see this video and share this video with more people um right i'm gonna see if we have some questions there is a question asking if the recording of traumerai uh, was with anita valfish playing the cello no no that one was oh not. you're mute are you on mute I don't think so. Can you not hear me? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> How about now? Sorry. Am I back? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. Wonderful. Oh, sorry, uh, people. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that particular recording was not of, of Anita playing. Okay. I, I, I was wondering if um, the, it sounds like all concentration camps had instruments. Do you think they, did they have their instruments especially for that? Where did they come from? Well, what happened in a lot of cases that is when people were arrested, they were allowed to bring, you know, belongings. They were even encouraged to bring belongings because, you know, they didn't know it, but they were going to be confiscated. So people often grabbed, you know, their instruments. They grabbed their violin, they grabbed a flute, they grabbed a guitar. Uh, and so as there were storehouses of all kinds of things in the camps, like eyeglasses and shoes. There were also storehouses full of instruments. And, and the Nazis also went around and, and confiscated instruments from Jewish homes, just like they did artwork. So yes, there were lots of, of fine instruments available in, in the camps. And of all the women that were alive, of course, when you were doing your research, did you manage to be in contact with all of them? Um, I was able to be in contact with Anita. Um, I, I, as far as I know, only Ed, Anita and Esther are still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I did get to have a conversation with Anita in 2018, which was a really incredible experience. I can imagine it must be hard as well because how to approach the subject and I saw such a uh, and um, sorry I'm, I'm, I'm hold on I uh, will we'll read people's questions instead of asking myself right uh, I'm interested in this is a question from Lauren Bernowski I am interested in learning everything I can about music in the Vilna ghetto could you share any other stories Ha, ha, ha. You might have to watch another video or write to Dr. <laughs> Kelly, but you can, of course, we, we, we still have seven minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so there's a little bit more about those stories and the Vilna in, in my book. And I also reference uh, in that book my friend Sonia Becker's book, Symphony on Fire, which is about her parents and goes into much greater detail about Vilna. There you go, Lauren. We're gonna. I'm gonna leave all the links in 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 a, in a moment. Um, Anna Campus, is there any books about them? About them? I'm not sure who are them. Anna, would you like to tell us who do, who do you mean by them? In the meantime, I I'll ask what was the most difficult parts of your research and the most rewarding parts as well? Well, it, it is emotionally very draining to to read these stories. Um, I'm to to try to put yourself in these situations and and you you come to know these people and I came to care about them deeply and their experiences and so it became very draining for me, but also I felt so compelled to, to share their stories and I just I would often become emotional, but I also decided at one point that if I stopped being emotional about it, if I grew callous to it, then it was time for me to stop writing about it and speaking about it so you know that that was a hard part um the rewarding part for me in so many ways were of course getting to know these stories and and looking to these people and and the lessons i can learn in my own life from from their lives but also meeting people meeting um survivors meeting the families of of survivors and and developing some close uh, friendships that will just last a lifetime i can imagine uh and we have another question from nikki have they written music afterwards based on their memories and the experience in the camps I don't know that any of the survivors in particular have written um, music. There are certainly a lot of Holocaust memorial pieces by various uh, composers. There have been um, an oratorio was written about Margaret Dryberg. Um, I list some of these pieces um, in my book, you know, even like, you know, Arnold Schoenberg wrote uh, a famous cantata, Survivor in Warsaw. 
Um, so there are lots of Holocaust themed pieces and, and memorial remembrance pieces out there to find. Um, but a lot of the people who were writing in the camps, you know, sadly did not survive. You mentioned uh, Alma Rose died in Auschwitz. Did she die in the gas chamber or did she die of something else? Yeah, it was, it was a really mysterious situation. Um, for a long time, people tried to figure out what happened to her. Just one Sunday evening, she became very sick, um, just all kinds of symptoms with uh, fever and, and headache and dizziness, and then began to have a seizure and then began to break out in blue spots. Um, she was such a, a prized prisoner in a way that they, they tried to save her life. They even called in Dr. Mangala, who didn't treat patients and they wanted help. And he ordered a spinal tap for her. And they actually did a spinal tap to see if she had meningitis, which came back inconclusive. And, and she eventually lost consciousness and died. And now today, it's pretty much accepted that she died of botulism, which is a very dangerous form of food poisoning because of some tinned meat that she had eaten that day. Mm. That's really strange. Uh, there is another question. Um, Sonergy. Uh, I have this book, excellent book by Mr. Michael Haas titled Forbidden Music, the Jewish composers banned by the Nazis. Nazis. Were you perhaps in touch with this author, Mrs. Brown? Um, I didn't contact the author, but I did read that book in uh, the course of writing my book. It's excellent. Yes, um, so we, we are gonna start thinking of ending as a chain. Uh, but before we do that, um, I have, I'm adding here on the chat, the link to Dr. Kelly's book on Amazon. I'm also going to add her uh, contact page in case people have more questions after watching uh, the video, maybe later on a later uh, moment, and would like to contact her um with more questions um i'm also adding the the beautiful song vigala by ilse weber uh, for people who would like to listen to her song and i would like to once again thank uh dr brown so much uh for all your dedication uh, i wish we had uh we, we might have more more events like this to, to talk about it and to share. Um, and as I said before, I really recommend all of you to buy her book uh, and go deeper into these stories uh, and, and share this video with more people uh, because it's such a, a wonderful work you've done to to document these women and uh, and and I'm sure there are many that we will never know. But yes, I, yes, and and thank you so much. It's been so wonderful to be here with you today and to get to know you and and the work that you're doing. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. And to all of you, um, I will leave our uh, contact. Here as well, we have a new event in April when we are going to be talking about Black female composers with a wonderful educator here in the UK. Um, uh, he wrote a book for t children actually called Where Are All the Black Female Composers? And I'm really looking forward to having this conversation because, you know, we talk about women in music, um, but, you know, we need to remember the old intersectionality that we need to focus as well and, you know where are all the black women composers the indigenous women composers and it will be wonderful to um to uh, discuss with him now i'm being distracted by the chat i'm so i'm so sorry mm -hmm. um yes sonergy it's fine you can watch the video later no problem 
So um, I would like to finish uh, with uh, an extract of a poem by Ilse, which she called uh, Musica Prohibita, Forbidden Music. And in the last part of the poem, she says, music lights up a poet's words from our plight brings release. Even the sparest songs of birds bear moments of blessed peace. And when again we lose our nerve, drowning, drowning in despair, the boundless beauty of the world wafts resuscitating air. Music is a beatitude. It is there salvation lies. Fearlessly, I tote my lute beneath the policeman's eyes. And I think that says it all, as you called uh, the title of your book, that music bringing solace in the lives of these women and by their generosity in the lives of others as well. You know, they all had to deal with so much and we honor them today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.